What do scientists really know? When and how do they know they know? What are their certainties, but also, and above all, their uncertainties, their questions, their doubts? What do they do with them? Hello, I am Anne-Laure Ganac. I'm a journalist at the Humanities College of the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, and you are listening to a podcast, Are You Sure?, Yes, yes, you are listening to a podcast, Are You Sure? is its title, and this is a question that will guide me to meet the people who do science at EPFL to take the pulse of their certainties and uncertainties. Uh, my name is Sylvie Roek. I was born in 1977. I graduated from Utrecht University in the year 2000 uh, after having completed studies in physics and chemistry. And I am now a professor at EPFL and heading the Laboratory of Fundamental Biophotonics uh, at the Institute of Bioengineering and Material Science. Thank you, Sylvie Roek, for accepting my invitation. First, could you tell us a little bit more about what you are doing in your lab? So in my laboratory, we develop optical tools to understand aqueous systems and interfaces. And then we also apply them to the aqueous systems and interfaces to understand um, the molecular structure of water uh, in solution and interfaces. And we try to do this with um, emphasizing uh, the role that water has in a biological environment. When did you understand that you wanted to be a scientist for sure? I wasn't sure for a long time. When I was doing chemistry, I was always drawn to the more fundamental aspects of the chemistry, and this made me also start with a physics study. And then, of course, at the end, you do master research, uh, which in my uh, in my case took uh, one and a half years because I completed uh, two masters. And during that research period, I felt that what I really like to do is investigate things. And so then I thought, okay, well, this is something I like to do. Let's try to find a PhD position. And then from there on, it kind of evolved. But why water? Why did you choose to study water? What made you think, okay, this is exactly what I want to study? Well, water is, is a very fascinating liquid. It's all around us. And it, you could think of water in two ways. You could think of water as the background that basically provides, uh, you know, against the which life evolves, let's say. Or you can think of water as an active mediator in this in this game. And we don't really know on a molecular level which one of those two scenarios is actually uh, the most appropriate one. And so water is very fascinating. But I haven't always studied water. When I did my PhD, for example, I was more focused on, on the, the optics and the technology and thinking about ways how to understand interfaces. But centuries of uh, scientists have tried to unravel the mysteries of water. This could be a, a deterrent for many people. What helped you think that you could make progress in this knowledge of water? Basically, from the from a technology side, I was working on developing technology that allows us to study interfaces in ways that we haven't done before. A liquid interface of small uh, droplet in water or a particle in water, understanding how the molecules are organized on these interfaces. And then, of course, you realize that the primary liquid uh, that you could look at is water. And so from that perspective, I started um, looking into water literature and communicating with people that do water research. And then it kind of emerged that uh, the further we got into the aqueous interfaces, we also realized, oh, but it's not only the interfaces, it's also uh, aqueous solutions. And actually, um, we've now developed say, three uh, main techniques, and all of these techniques have something very interesting to say about water. And so this is how it kind of emerged. And since these are techniques that are kind of worldwide unique, we have something to attribute. As you said, water is everywhere around and in us. We can uh, have uh, a lot of prejudice uh, about it and think that we know what it is, how it works, how it interacts with various uh, materials. How do you manage to, to put aside all these ideas you may also have on, on water? That's not so difficult because when you go into the lab and when you get data, you basically look at that from the perspective 
of analyzing that data and understanding what it actually means. And so whatever you find from those studies is then the result that you contribute to the literature. Your work has enabled you to question, among other things, a hypothesis that has been a reference in this field since the 19th century. Uh, could you sum it up in a few words for us? Now, yeah, what we have uh, discovered a couple of years ago is that when you put ions, salts, in water, there is, of course, the interaction between the ions and the water molecules because ions are charged. And water molecules have a charge distribution, so they have a dipole moment, and these ions therefore orient the dipole moment. And this interaction is very well known for a long time. Um, what we discovered is that there is another interaction whereby the electrostatic field from all the ions in solutions also influence the way water interacts with other water molecules. And that's basically quite a surprising finding. And uh, these interactions can be measured over distances that are surprisingly long if you compare them to what we what we used to think is normal. So not over the distance of two water molecules, but these interactions, we've measured them over maybe 100 water molecules, which is quite long from a molecular perspective. Well, I guess it's not that easy to uh, admit that you may have shaken up a, a theory that has been uh, uh, widely accepted by all your predecessors. Initially, you have the idea that perhaps there is something, and then you do more experiments and more experiments and more experiments to essentially really confirm for yourself that this is actually the case, that you're not looking at something trivial or an artifact or that there could be another explanation. And then you try to confirm this with other methods, uh, maybe with, with uh, theory. And if everything is consistent, then um, I'm convinced enough to put this out to the rest of the scientific community. And then, of course, they are going to, other people are going to think about it and maybe do experiments. And then it's confirmed. But Of course, maybe uh, in, in some time from now, um, this whole stuff is put in a different light by experiments that I didn't know existed. So it's an evolving, especially with water, it's very, our, our knowledge of water, we can always say is very fluidic. It's continuously evolving. Of course, there's always constants in it because uh, there's many things that, that uh, we really do know, eh? like the boiling point really is uh, 100 degrees Celsius at atmospheric pressure. Um, but there are also things that uh, emerge as new and interesting. And yet, Sylvie Roque, aren't you driven by the wish to access to some uh, intangible truth? No, my drive. I mean, my driving force. What I really like about science is that you're the first to do something, very often, and then you are also the first to to think about it and put it in context and try to understand and explain it to other people. And that is not necessarily meaning that I want to change things. I mean, sometimes we do experiments that simply confirm what, what we already knew, and that's also perfectly fine. How has your relationship to truth evolved since you became a researcher? Um, it has evolved, but not so much because of the research. When I was a student, I became a, I guess a member or a student of something that was called the University of Uselessness which was an organization that was set up by scientists slash artists who had a vision that true academic training is coming from not just learning the knowledge and making it your and, and, and just memorizing it, but making the knowledge your own through kind of a, a game whereby you look at facts and then you put the facts in a different perspective and you do this through discussions with people and so i went i went through a bunch of uh, courses which were very you know they were t they were on a campground in a big farm and we were all sitting with uh, 20 students from different fields on a table with professors that we had invited to come and uh, talk to us about things that they thought they know but also to not with the aim to teach us things but also to discuss And so in that process, I really uh, shape my my uh, relationship to the truth because very often the truth can be, um, you know, when you're a small kid, the truth is what your parents tell you. When you go to university, the truth is whatever you find in a textbook. When you do research, well, the truth might not be anymore in the textbook. But also the truth can be whatever you and I agree upon is the truth. And so the truth is, is not, uh, I don't think there is an absolute truth. The truth is uh, much more complex than that. What is the power of science according to you? 
well, the power of science is to understand things in the in the way of science, in the, in in the way that I choose to work. Let's say we have rules on how to deal with with facts and how what facts are, and within those rules, we know this is the truth. But that's really within the game of science. If I am uh, uh, associated with some kind of religion, then uh, my truth is dictated by what I have understood the truth to be from my religious perspective. It's different for everyone, of course. I would say that the scientific rules are especially useful because they are applicable to many different ways. And so we can expand and because we make hypotheses and because we verify it, we can progress in our understanding in a way that allows us to uh, design and create uh, new technological uh, uh, useful items. But it's not the absolute truth. Did philosophy help you in any way to build your relation to truth? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I did in this course was to to repeat uh, the thought experiment of Descartes and just ask yourself, what is really, really, really real? What I see through my senses, is that real? Or can it be that I'm dreaming a dream or I'm being dreamed by somebody else? And when you go and you do this, uh, you realize that there's not much that's really real. There's there's two things that are real, is mainly the fact that you're thinking, and uh, the awareness that you have of your experience. Those are the only two things that I are actually real. And for the rest, it could be somebody else who's dreaming me and I'm being dreamed. You know, we can think of ourselves as, as really important because, you know, we decide what is the truth, right? Uh, but when you think about it like that from a philosophical uh, perspective, it makes things much lighter. You know, it's humbling, right, in a certain sense. You spent time uh, at the University of Uselessness, you said, and yet now you are working on understanding how water molecules interact with uh, other molecules, which can be very useful. It can be of great help in many fields, medicine, material and environmental sciences. Is it for you... Is it important for you that your fundamental research can lead to applications in the future? It's important for me that my research is relevant, which means that I won't study just any question, but I will try to target questions that have a broad general interest. But it can also, it, this doesn't have to be practical. It can be, you know, purely curiosity driven. Like these long range interactions, well, they're 99.9% .9 curiosity driven. I don't think there's any technology that's going to emerge from that soon. From that discovery. What is emerging from our discoveries as a side product is that the optical tools that we develop can also be used for other purposes. And so that's where I think the technology that we build ends up being useful and maybe in ways that I can't see right now uh, because it's continuously evolving, but it's not a driving force for me. It happens to be a side product. For me, it's the curiosity that is the most important driving force. Uh, Sylvie Roque, you have just uh, been elected APS, which is American Physical Society Fellow, which is a, a distinct honor, though one of many prizes and distinctions you have already received. How do you consider these tokens of recognition regarding, well, the questions we've been discussing so far? Does it help you in any way to have less doubts and more certainties in your research? Um, as an APS fellow or, or having received other forms of recognition, this is not changing my way of truth perception. What it does do is that it's easier to uh, communicate new results to the community. If you are known by others, if your work is known by others, um, if in the past uh, my lab has been able to make high quality, well-recognized uh, contributions, then uh, this is also easier to do that in the future. So that's where recognition is uh, really uh, nice and, uh, and handy, let's say. What is your main conviction today about the role that science should play in our societies, the place it should have, and also its impact? I think science is important to help put things in perspective, how we can see things, how we can understand things. You know we're now having a pandemic and science actually has been mightily useful in creating vaccines that are hopefully going to help us. And so in that sense, science is, is very useful compared to other things. But also sometimes we create technologies that are turn out to be more destructive than, than useful. So my 
personal opinion is that fundamental curiosity driven science is probably the most uh, efficient way to broaden our horizon in how we see the world and how we understand things. And this we should certainly do in. I guess target technological developments are also good, but sometimes you end up developing something that you didn't intend and it wasn't the purpose that you had in mind. That's difficult. And with any with any scientific discovery, you don't always have have uh, control over what you can do with it or what other people can do with it. You just talked, Sylvie Roque, about the vaccines, but at the moment now that we are talking, uh, we can see that many people are suspicious about vaccines. They are not really sure that they should uh, believe what science and what medicines say about it. Yeah, that is difficult. I think that we need to agree with with each other on what we consider facts and what we consider fantasy. When you grow up, at least when I grew up, there was no internet. And it's easy to do your research. You go to the library and you have a book and the book has an author. And there is a certain value in this because the book has been produced, evaluated by others. Nowadays, anyone can write anything about anything on social media or on the internet. And so for many people, it's a lot harder to determine uh, what is a fact and what is a fantasy. Especially when you have social media with timelines that are particularly on your interest. So if you're interested in uh, skeptical articles about vaccines, then Facebook and they will make sure that this is the only thing you read. It's, it's I think, harder these days to find uh, valuable literature. And especially when it deals with scientific topics, I think you have to still use the scientific method and Make sure that what you're reporting is based on on facts. Of course, there's many other ways to deal with what you think is the truth. If you simply believe in in things, then then this is what you have to do. But um, I think in this time and age, it's becoming much harder to do that. Sylvie Roque, if there was only one thing you were sure about today as a scientist, what would it be? Well, if there's one thing that I'm sure of, is that you can't really be sure of anything. But you can still use things as as building blocks, right? So obviously you can't start from scratch every time you do something. So you have to rely on on the work of others. And if they have used, you know, a good scientific method to do that, then this is what what I will use for for uh, for my research. And so the truth is not something absolute. There's a lot of fluidity there, especially if we are in the edge of the scientific research, we discover new things, we reinterpret uh, other things. And so the more I learn, the more I know that what I know is very little. So at some point, you know what you don't know, if if you see what I mean. Thank you, Sylvie Roque. Thank you. (laughs) It was Sylvie Roque heading the Laboratory of Biophotonics at the Institute of Bioengineering and Material Science at EPFL. I'm looking forward to introducing you to another EPFL researcher in a future episode and discussing science, truth, certainties and uncertainties. Thank you.